Welcome to Bible Essentials. My name is Sarah Ruff. I am so glad you are joining me on this beautiful spring day here in Northwest Arkansas for the study of Daniel. It's a great study. It's a timely study, and I'm happy you are here. Before we start reading Daniel chapter 1, I want to give you the context behind it or give you a time frame in which this was taking place. I've got to take you all the way back to 1st and 2nd Samuel and 1st and 2nd King. Remember, the first king over all of Israel was Saul. And then the second king over all of Israel was David. And then the third king over all of Israel was Solomon. It was with Solomon that God said, because of Solomon's sin of his heart turning away from God, uh, God told Solomon that he was going to split the kingdom. He was going to give 10 tribes, 10 of those 12 tribes, to his servant Jeroboam, but because of the covenant that God made with his father David, he would give Solomon's son Rehoboam one tribe, which was the tribe of Judah. And so through first and second kings, when you're reading, you're going to read the king that ruled over Israel, those 10 northern tribes, and you're going to read about the king that was ruling over Judah, which included some of Benjamin. Now, Assyria was a world power, and it came because of Israel, those 10 northern tribes' sin. God caused Assyria to come and conquer those 10 northern tribes and carry them off to Assyrian captivity. Not quite 100 years later, God raised up Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, because of Judah's sin. God raised up King Nebuchadnezzar, King of Babylon, to come and take Judah to Babylonian captivity. Now, King Nebuchadnezzar would come against Jerusalem three different times. So there would be three deportations of the Jews and the vessels and the articles used in temple uh, worship, in the worship of God, back to Babylon. And that's exactly where Daniel chapter 1 begins. It was the first time that King Nebuchadnezzar came against Jerusalem that Jehoiakim, the king of that time, and Daniel and some of the nobility were carried to Babylonian captivity. King Nebuchadnezzar would come back a second time and take, remember, the prophet Ezekiel and 10,000 people and more articles in the temple back to Babylonian captivity. King Nebuchadnezzar would come a third time against Jerusalem and burn the temple, the palace, burn Jerusalem to the ground and take the remaining um, Jews back to Babylonian captivity. So that's where we are in history. We are literally uh, at the end of the kings. Remember, once King Nebuchadnezzar came and burned Jerusalem to the ground and carried all of the Jews back to Babylonian captivity. Remember, that would be the last time that a king of the line of Judah would rule on the kingdom. It, it ends that time, ends the times of the kings for Jerusalem, for Israel. They would have governors when they return back to the land after those 70 years in Babylonian captivity. They would have governors and the high peace priest would rule over them, but they would not have a king. The next legitimate king to rule over Judah to rule over Israel is going to be Christ. That's why when Christ came the first time, they were looking for their king. They were looking for the king of the son of David to reign and rule from Jerusalem. Okay, let's get back then to Daniel chapter 1. Let me begin reading. You've got kind of the time where we are, a time frame of where Daniel is taking place. So it says this, chapter 1, verse 1, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and laid siege to it. 
The Lord, the Lord handed Jehoiakim, king of Judah, over to him, along with some of the vessels of the house of God. Nebuchadnezzar carried them to the land of Babylon, to the house of his God, and put the vessels in the treasury of his God. That was so typical back then that one nation that conquered another nation would take their gods and take them back to their temple and put them at the feet of their gods. And that's exactly what King Nebuchadnezzar is doing. He conquers Jerusalem. He goes in, he goes in and takes, because there's no idols, he takes some of the vessels and he, the serving vessels that they used and carried them back to Babylon and put it in his temple at the feet of his God saying, my God is stronger than your God because we've been able to defeat you. Verse three, the king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his court officials. Some of your Bibles might say the chief of the eunuchs. I'll get back to that in a minute. To bring some of the Israelites from the royal family and from the nobility, young men without any physical defect, good looking, suitable for instruction in all wisdom, knowledge perception, perceptive, and capable of serving in the king's palace and to teach them the Chaldean language and literature. The king assigned them daily provisions from the royal food and from the wine that he drank. They were to be trained for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to serve in the king's court. So King Nebuchadnezzar wants Ashpenaz to bring him some of those Israelites that he had carried captive. He wanted them from the nobility he wanted them smart. He wanted them good looking. He wanted them without any physical defect. And he was going to train them up for three years, assimilate them, and let them serve in the king's palace to help um, um, help rule over all the Israelites that he had carried captive down there. Verse 6, among them... From the descendants of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So if you were going to describe Daniel, Hananiah, uh, Mishael, and Azariah to someone, how would you describe them? Well, we would describe them from the royal family or nobility. We would describe them as young, without physical defect. We would describe them as good-looking. We would describe them as smart perceptive, capable of learning. That's how we would describe them. Verse seven, the chief official gave them different names. To Daniel, he gave the name Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. And to Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. All right, let me go back and talk very quickly about um, verse three, when it says that the king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his court officials or the chief of the eunuchs, to bring some of the Israelites from the royal family and from nobility. What does that mean? Well, I want to show you in Isaiah. Isaiah prophesied about this. I pro prophesied that some of the kings of Judah would be carried off. Uh, descendants from the kings of Judah would be carried off into Babylonian captivity and serve in the king's court as eunuchs. Let me read this to you. It's You can read it in 2 Kings 20, 17 and in Isaiah 39, 7. It says this, And some of the descendants from your own flesh and blood who will be born to you will be taken away and they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of a Babylon. And that was very typical in that day. If you worked or you served in the palace close with the king, that he would make you become a eunuch so that you couldn't spread or they couldn't spread their seed around. So that's why they would do that. And eunuchs, for those who don't know, some of the ladies in my Bible said he didn't know that would be, they would castrate the men so that they could not get women pregnant. They could not spread their seed, their children around. Okay, so I just wanted you to see that Isaiah prophesies this very thing. 
All right, moving on then to verse 8. Daniel determined that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine he drank. Now, why would Daniel not want to defile himself with the king's food? Why? I guess the question is, why would that be defiling to eat the king's food? Well, I'm going to um, read you a couple verses just to give us a little backdrop on this. Uh, Psalm 141 4 says, do not let your heart be drawn to what is evil, so that I take part in wicked deeds along with those who are evildoers. Do not let me eat their delicacies. Proverbs 23.10 says, do not crave his delicacies, for that food is deceptive. Uh Leviticus 11.47 says you must distinguish between the unclean and the clean, between animals that may be eaten and those that may be not. And so I think it was a little of both of these things why Daniel did did not want to be defiled by the king's food, why the king's food could defile him. Number one is that, remember, when they were in Jerusalem, food was scarce. They were a beggarly, beggarly nation, poor. Uh, Food was scarce, and all of a sudden, this king of Babylon, this heathen, godless king of Babylon comes in and wants to give them the best food that they could possibly eat. So I think it's a little bit of that so that they could assimilate them and that they could train them up. And they even gave him, in fact, you'll find out later that uh, Daniel's name was at uh, the Daniel's name that belt uh, that King Nebuchadnezzar had given him was after his own God. And so to assimilate them, to get them to come into the Babylonian um, way of life. And so I think that is one reason why Daniel does not want to be defiled. And two, God had given them strict instructions on what animals were clean and what animals were uh, clean and unclean to eat. Also, another part of this could be that um, the foreign kings, the foreign nations would take the best parts of the animals and sacrifice it to their gods. And then the kings would get to eat those best portions. And so, again, I think that is all of those things, both spiritual and physical, that would that the king's food would defile Daniel, and he didn't want any part of that. And so he uh, purposes, so he asked permission from the chief official not to defile himself. God had granted Daniel favor and compassion from the chief official. Don't miss that. It is God who granted him. It is God alone who granted him favor and compassion from the chief official. Verse 10, yet he said to Daniel, my Lord, the king assigned your food and drink. I'm afraid of what would happen if he saw your faces looking thinner than those of the other young men your age. You would endanger my life with the king. So Daniel said to the guard whom the chief official had assigned to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then examine our appearance and the appearance of the young men who are eating the king's food and deal with your servants based on what you see. He agreed with them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, they looked better and healthier than all the young men who were eating the king's food. So the guard continued to remove their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. Very Very simplistic here. Let's move on to verse 17. God gave these four young men knowledge and understanding. Again, don't miss it. It is God that gives them knowledge and understanding. Um, In every kind of literature and wisdom, Daniel also understood visions and dreams of every kind. I'm so thankful because our very next chapter, there's going to be a dream. Verse 18, at the end of the time, the king had said, at the end of time that the 
king had said to present them, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king interviewed them, and among all of them, no one was found equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they began to serve in the king's court. In every matter of wisdom and understanding that the king consulted them about, he found them ten times better than all the diviner priests and mediums in his entire kingdom. Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. And you'll find out who King Cyrus is in a couple chapters. So I think Daniel chapter one is so very clear. King Nebuchadnezzar comes in to Babylon and takes Jehoiakim and Daniel and some of the nobles uh, and some of the people back to Babylonian captivity. King Nebuchadnezzar wants the Israelites, some of the Israelites, he wants the good looking ones. He wants the smart ones. He wants the ones without any physical defect. He wants to train them up for three years and give them a portion of the king's food. He wants it all to be wonderful so that he can, they can help serve in his palace. Now, I want to remind you that King Nebuchadnezzar had taken numerous other young men, but it was just four that set them apart, that set themselves apart, that determined that they would not defile them with the king's food that would be set apart from Babylon. Just remember that moving forward. And then, of course, God gave them favor. God gave them knowledge and understanding. And for Daniel, the ability to interpret dreams. Thank goodness, because in our very next chapter, chapter two, King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. I hope you'll join me for chapter two. We'll see you next Thursday.